Hi, fashion dolls. It is finally Fierce Female Friday, February 24th, and welcome to an all-new episode of Style by Stevie. Today, we have an icon in the dollhouse, Ty Grandison Jones, ladies and gentlemen. Now, here's a fact about him. He is a descendant of Creole and Cuban heritage, and I'm so honored to have him here in the dollhouse to discuss his prolific acting career and so much more. It has been an amazing week with all of these amazing men hearing all of their stories and so much more. So today you're going to get it from a legend's standpoint, and I'm super excited to have him here to dish on his acting career and his acting roles. He's done hit films such as Con Air, Harlem Nights, and CB4. Without further ado, Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome a legend, a king. Ladies and gentlemen, Ty Granderson Jones. Hello. Hello. You're killing me with this legend thing, man. My you sweet. are. You are. <laughs> it is such a pleasure to have you here. How are you? Looking, you're looking beautiful. Thank you. I told you I would not be looking like I did earlier. Thank God. <laughs> thank God for a great team. Special thanks to Melanie for making sure that we're right every episode. So before we kick off this interview, how has 2023 been for you so far? Like 2020. 22, <laughs> grinding. Uh, matter of fact, I'm in the car because early when we test, I'm in a meeting here with some partners here at the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood. So I'm running. I just figured it would, you know, the sound wise and a little bit more privacy and and one on one, running back and forth and jumping in the car. And like I said earlier, excuse me, I can't find my regular. I, I'm blind as a bat and I can't find my. It's raining in L.A. Why am I wearing? It's like, I can't find my regular, uh, my regular glasses. Um, 2023. Um, hmm. You know, in Hollywood, it seems to, uh, the years and time seem to blend together, you know, uh, because everything is, is sort of like quarterly, you know what I mean? And, and whatever, momentum we have in terms of the last year it bleeds into the next year so it's all just one big bled grind if you know what i'm trying to say okay. um but i i'm looking forward to the the clean slate uh so to speak to uh perhaps get things done that we were we were unable to get done in 2022 you know for me more specifically uh as you know i write as well and produce a little bit and uh so i'm really excited about this western uh this uh afrocentric western that me and uh actor stoney jackson i don't know if you remember stoney yeah. jackson the a lot star well it's our project uh we uh we came up with the story and i wrote it and we're really excited about it so that's getting a lot of our, our attention right now uh of course auditioning and and just doing the actor hollywood thing that we do uh, so 2023 is uh is 2023 <laughs> you know what i mean uh the thing about it is this time is never really on your side and you feel like you know you just got to keep grinding grinding before you know it i mean look it's march already jesus yeah. christ <laughs> You know, time is moved by so fast. Yeah. Like, it's literally, like you said, hitting that reset button and having right. to start all over. Right. right. You know, I read in a, in a science magazine a few years back that the reason why time seems to be moving faster to us is the way we measure time is a little bit outdated because the, the evolution of the planet, which is time, is, has sped up a little bit. So, so, we're behind in terms of how we calibrate time. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't mean Again. to go astronaut. I didn't mean to go astronaut on you, but <laughs> no, yeah. no, absolutely, absolutely. So you are 
are a protege of the amazing Alan Schneider. Tell us about that. Say it again. I'm sorry. I said you are protege of the amazing, the incomparable Alan Schneider. Tell us a little yeah, bit about yeah. that. Well, Alan Schneider, God bless his soul, um, yes. is, is, was one of the premier American directors in theater, in American theater, and around the world. And Alan um, introduced Samuel Beckett to America. Uh, Samuel Beckett is, uh, it was, you know, plays like Waiting for Godot. Samuel Beckett was one of the most uh, avant-garde playwrights back in the day, uh, and still is. Is his plays like Waiting for Godot, they're classics. Well, Alan Schneider was the first to introduce Samuel Beckett to America and to the American theater by doing the play uh, Waiting for Godot. And he also was the first um, uh, to stage uh, Edward Albee's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Uh, and he's directed, he directed uh, big stars from the theater back in the day, Marilyn Monroe, uh, Marlon Brando, all those guys. And and uh, anyway, when I met Alan, I was actually working at the actor's studio. I just graduated from Florida A&M University, FAMU yeah. and Florida State University, which was a co-op program at Florida A&M University was the, the you know, the um, Department of Theater and at Florida State University was a school of theater. And I ended up doing more at uh, Florida State because they had a bigger program and it was a school of theater. And so when I when I was at, at uh, Florida State, I met this little guy who I didn't know. Sometimes ig ignorance can work for you. I didn't know who Lee Strasberg was. And he had come down and did a big workshop. And, uh, and, and I was just cocky little kid. And I I got in his face one day. I was walking across campus after the workshops that we had done all day at Florida State School of Theater. And he, I can't, I, to this day, I assume he was waiting for a cab to take him back to the airport to go back up to New York. And for those of you who don't know who Lee Strasberg is, he's considered to be one of the greatest acting teachers in the world ever. He's the, uh, the mentor of people like Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and uh, Sidney Poitier. And these guys, but anyway, uh, long story short to the Alan Schneider connection is uh, I told Lee Strasberg when I was a student at Florida State and I, you know, I went up to the, it was a small guy like me. And I go, you know, when I, when I graduate, I'm coming to New York and I'm coming to work with you. And he was, took a step back and looked at me, you know, and like I said, ignorance can work for you. I mean, I'm poking one of the greatest acting teachers in the world in his chest. And it, yeah, but I didn't know I'm learning. So anyway, I end up going to New York, and I end up waiting for. He wasn't doing much at at that time, and uh, and I would stake out in front of the actor studio at his office. And one day he showed up because he was spending a lot of time in L.A. and actually doing films. He did Godfather Two. He played Hyman Roth in Godfather Two. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, I ended up doing some things in his class and Alan Schneider at the time was the head of theater program at Juilliard. He was creeping around the actor studio and saw me do something and asked me if I wanted to workshop workshop a uh, an ethnic version of Waiting for Godot, Beckett's Waiting for Godot, and put it in the during the Civil War. So, excuse me, I workshopped uh, the role of Lucky, uh, and which made it the, the role like more of a slave. It was very interesting twist and take on it. In the middle of doing this workshop, Alan got, a, got an opportunity to go out to the University of California, San Diego, and La Jolla, California, to develop an MFA program in directing. And at that time, he said, look, we're going to have to put this on hold. But, kid, how would you like to go out to uh, California, the University of California, San Diego, and get your Master's of Fine Arts mm -hmm. yeah. in Acting, which is one of the UCSD, one of the top three programs in the world? And I was like, hell yeah. I mean, you know, the way I was thinking, see, I always wanted to do film. And I wasn't big on theater, but a uh, little Florida boy, not knowing much of how to break into film, uh, majoring 
acting in theater was my way. So when he said going out to California and, and going to, you know, I was getting closer to Hollywood. And that's how I was thinking at the time. So anyway, um, I ended up going, flying from New York to Chicago to see the, the chairman of the department and uh, auditioning for him at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. And by the time I got back to New York, they had already accepted me in the program and flew back and, and uh, to get my master's of uh, fine arts and in, in, uh, MFA in acting uh, with the full fellowship. And I was the first and only brother, uh, a person of color for that to happen. Uh, and, uh, and so I went with Alan Schneider, the great Alan Schneider, to the University of California, San Diego, uh, in La Jolla and, uh, you know, ended up three years later getting my master's degree, fine arts, master's MFA in acting. And, uh, which doesn't mean shit in Hollywood, <laughs> you know, nobody really, you know, but I care. And there, there are many of us, it's not the, the master's, the, the degree itself, but it's the, the time that we put in the grind that we put in, to get that piece of paper, which, which really prepared me for the grind here, you know, so to speak. And uh, but we lost Alan, man, which was. Uh, I remember when I graduated, he goes, he says, when you're rich and famous, you're going to remember me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I and because uh, and he, he had a lot of confidence in my craft and I was going to go and do big things. But we need a lot. Nobody makes it anywhere without somebody lifting them, them up if they weren't born into it. You know what I mean? And. The thing that breaks my heart, other than me just having loved Alan, is he was one of my allies that died early at the beginning of my career because he was in London directing a uh, a new play, and because of the difference in traffic, you know, the how cars are going in different directions, he stepped out into the street and looked the wrong direction and got hit by a guy on a motorcycle and got into a coma and died and, and and it broke my heart and and i i know that it, it affected without sounding selfishly about his demise it affected the tra the, tra the trajectory of my career you know so um but i miss him and and uh you know i'm, I'm so blessed to have worked with uh, some really big time mentoring guys in the theater and and, and so forth you know now you've done over a total of eighty plays, and I'm Close pretty sure there, yeah. yes, you've done a rendition of a Raising the Sun, which is a classic. Everyone is talking about, and so many others. We talked about Alan Snyder. What is one piece of advice that he's given you along the way to take you in your career? Because we'll get into the acting credits. The CB4, everybody um, knows you from films like that, and right, Carl, right. which we'll talk about. But right. This, Alan give you any advice along the way? You know, he, he outside of the craft itself, uh, he he uh, he really didn't. Um, you know, and 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 that's the thing about what I do when I coach and I teach, which I don't do too much these days. It takes a lot of energy and time. Is during that time, and and pretty. Pretty much, it's still the same way. These programs really focus on craft. Yeah. They don't really focus on business. You know what I mean? And you come into the business thinking that if you're a great actor, that's all that matters. And, nah, that's not. That's not it. Um, so he didn't really. I mean, he gave me a lot of advice in in terms of craft and home my craft but not so much in business Alan just believed that um, I was going to be a big star that was never really important to me uh, and he never meant it in a negative way uh, he just felt that I was just going to come to Hollywood and blow it up because of my uh, my tenacity and my craft and um, you know uh, I guess my personality you know and those things but but it wasn't uh you know those that gave me most the most advice that i worked with when i was getting my masters was a guy by the name of of 
Luther James. Oh, yeah. And he was he was my first year acting teacher in the program. Very eloquent black man. A lot of people don't know of Luther James. He's one of the unsung guys. Luther James directed early episodes of the old Mission Impossible series, you know? And Luther James coached Diana Ross for the Wiz, See. you know? And he gave me advice because he was one of the few, you know, there's academia and then there's Hollywood. And then the line blurs. And then uh, so uh, Luther, even though he was in the academic system, was also in the hot. Hollywood system, and so he had, he gave me advice in terms of how to navigate uh, this guy forsaken town, <laughs> you know, this game, you know. So, um, yeah. Now, with that being said, from safe place to now hit films, you've done the box office cult classic, which is like a hip hop film and comedy mixed into one. <laughs> CB4, which was released March 12, 1990. Yeah, <laughs> directed by Tamara Davis, and yeah. it won 16.9 million in box office. It would have been it would have yeah. yeah, it would have it would have done better than that. Um, first of all, I, I didn't even want to do CB4. You know, uh, it, it, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't at the it, it was. Uh, uh, it was a, a survival, and from what I've heard over the years, the role Forty Dog, which is an iconic little role, every everywhere yeah. I go, they're back, bitches, you know. But um, that role was originally written for. for they wanted a, a small, tough, uh, gangsterish uh, guy, which is sort of I made my niche, um, and, and uh, so I, that role was originally written for two small. I mean, too short. The rapper is is what I've been told, you know. But I didn't even really want to do it because it wasn't my kind of, you know. I didn't want to do the little crazy spoofy black comedy film, you know. As a kid, I always wanted to do the big Oscar content. I want to be yeah. taken seriously, you know what I mean? So at the time, it was like, eh, I'll do it because I need to pay my rent. <laughs> You know what I mean? It was an opportunity. And, and um, you know, we didn't know it was going to be a cult classic. We didn't know that books and articles were going to be written about how this film influenced the future of hip-hop. You know, we, 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 we didn't have a clue. And I didn't have a clue. When you do these films, it's like Con Air is the same way. It's a big classic, you know. And I'm blessed to have, they're, they're my bookends of everything that I've done in film and TV, uh, is CB4 and Con Air. Those are my, and they both are classics. And I'm very grateful and blessed to have had those experiences. But CB4 was, um, you know, I remember Chris would, and, and Charlie, and me and Charlie had become very, very close. Cause, and I miss him every day. I still have his last voicemail to me. I refuse to get rid of it. Uh, but I had done Harlem Nights. Yes. And, 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 uh, and, and Richard uh, Pryor, Red Fox. Yeah. And, and originally, I was booked in the role that Arsenio had done. And, and the way it goes, I don't know how much true. I've never really talked to Eddie at one time. Me and Eddie were pretty tight, too. And you know, and I'm more tight with Ray, his his uh, cousin, you know, the, who keeps me in the loop with Eddie and stuff. Um, but I think Eddie and Arsenio were about to fall out because Eddie really wanted Arsenio to do the role and then Arsenio felt the role wasn't big enough for him, you know. So they had booked me in their role. And, uh, and uh, at the last minute, Arsenio decided to do it and they had already... Uh, negotiated my contract, had to pay me. So Eddie and I was like, look, we got some improvisational ideas for this little gangster guy in the casino, which ended up being one of the funniest scenes in the movie, me and Red Fox and, and so forth. But I had to develop a, a relationship through that with Charlie. So when CB4 came, I, I had to read with, with Charlie. Me and Charlie had to test screen tests together for Chris 
uh, and the director. And me and Charlie just immediately had chemistry, you know. Uh, and uh, but I recall, and this, and people have to remember, this was at the beginning of of Chris's of Chris blowing up, yes. and, and 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 he wasn't as sophisticated as he is now in terms of understanding craft and the process and that kind of thing because he used to make fun at me and poke fun at me uh that i was just taking this little spoofy my role so serious <laughs> you know so and if you go back and look at 40 dog i played the straight guy i you know i was a straight and i played it straight which made it funny you know but Chris would always pick at me and go, oh, you one of those actors, I'm from the theater, and you one of those theater? I go, yeah, that's me. But it worked, you know? And um, and one of my other experiences, too, is I remember Charlie showed up, and we had never worked together, and then we weren't as tight as we had gotten. And he didn't know his lines that well. And I said, you know what, Charlie? There are a couple of things. Everybody already saying you got this role because you're Eddie's brother. That's number one. Number two, if I, I'm going to do this film and this stuff, we got to be on our game, man. You know, I'm in a scene with you. And you got to get on your game, Charlie. And the next day, Charlie came and he blew the roof off. And that was the beginning of Charlie understanding that he had to prove his prove his own. And, and from under the, the shadow of Eddie, pretty much. You know what I mean? Uh, but it was a great, we had fun. We had great experience, but we had no idea that we were making history. You know, everybody was in it doing cameos, you know, Isaac Hayes, you know, you know um, and Isaac is at the end of the film, like doing, you know how they do after the end of the film, the takeouts and stuff, because he didn't okay. really end up in the film. So Isaac's at the end of the film, but, but uh, Easy e Halle Berry, Shaquille O'Neal, everybody did cameos in the film. I mean, it was sort of ahead of the stunt casting idea. It was sort of ahead of the curve, you know, by casting all these real individuals playing themselves coming in and stuff. But we we, we had a ball, and uh, I made a lot of money and, uh, and paid my rent <laughs> and moved on, you know. But we had no idea that it was going to be uh, this big. And it would have done what I was gonna say. Would have done better at the box office. It yes. opened number one at the box office, but there was a major, major snowstorm. It opened around about this time March, during that year, and there was a major snowstorm that opening weekend uh, on the East Coast, and that affected the numbers. You know, yeah. That sucks. And back to how. Nights because you had an ensemble class. All, both of these films are cult classics, and yeah. the entire black community grew up with this film. For me, I know the lines like the back of my hand for Harlem Nights, especially Della Reese's part, like I am in charge of the girl. So, um, you had Layla Rochon in the film, yeah, you Hall, you had Tommy Ford Payne from Martin, God Layla bless Tommy Ford, Ford. Martin. you had. Yeah. Red Fox, Richard Pryor, Charlie yeah. Murphy, Robin Harris was in there. Rest yeah. his soul, yeah. like Rest his soul. in the comedy we, world. We had a lot of fun, man. And Eddie was in folks that don't don't remember Eddie directed. You know, he co wrote, he wrote and directed. And Eddie yes. was just you know, Red Red Fox didn't like me. Um because out of all the little things that Eddie had me doing bouncing around the, the casino just doing improvisational things. The one that stuck in the movie was me at the table with Red Fox when he go, I got something I item. When you get it the fuck out your eye, you blind motherfucker, and you go, I ain't gonna yeah. be too many more motherfuckers. You know, that was real. <laughs> that that moment in the film, I ain't gonna be too many more motherfuckers. That was real. Uh, Red, look, let me put it this way. Red Fox was old and sick at the time. But we know that a younger, healthier Red Fox would have eaten me alive. <laughs> you know what I mean? In terms of improvisation and 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 he just couldn't, you know, I'm this young, hungry, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going for it, man. And probably anything goes. And Eddie would just go cut. And he would go try to help Red out and go whisper. Look, when he said, we give him things just to, to come back with, with me. You know what I mean? Because he was a little shaky and I was so hardcore and hungry that it was making uh, Red even more shaky and nervous. And he was, he, and he didn't like that I was on his ass like that. You know what I mean? But I was just doing my job. But at the, uh, after we shot, after, after it was all over, I, I went up to him and said, look, you wanted my hero. I hope this, you know, I'm just, we working and, yeah. and my, uh, my uncles are jazz legends. They're both dead now. Cannonball and Nat Adderley. Yeah. Those are, those are my uncles. And 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 Nat, uh, you know, Cannonball died a long time ago. But Nat was still alive at the time, and he knew I was working. And we say, "Tell Red." And I said, "Look, Red, I apologize. I'm just doing my job, Mr. Fox. Um, but my uncle Nat Adderley wanted me to say hello to you. Oh, Nat! And it broke some ice, and we got to be, you know. But kudos to Eddie. Eddie saved Red Fox because uh, the IRS had taken everything he had. He was broke yeah. when he did all of that. Remember that. And and. Eddie came. That was one of the reasons that inspired Eddie. He said, you know what? Before I'm going to put the great ones together with me in this film. I mean, come on. Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, Red Fox, comedian, you know. And I already knew Richard because one of the, another unsung star, uh, thespian, African-American, uh, Art Evans, who played uh, Private Wilkie in A Soldier's Story. Mm -hmm. Art Evans, um, who was also in CB4, but me and Art Evans had done an NBC pilot, and Art saw me on stage when I first got to Hollywood, and he took me under his wing. So when Art was doing JoJo Dancer with Richard Pryor, he yeah. called me one day and said, man, I'm going down to the set to hang out with Richard in his trailer. You want to come with me? I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, so... Imagine this, me, Art, and just Richard Pryor hanging out in this trailer, just the three of us, you know? And I remember there was a bowl of fruit, and Richard was, was like, hey, uh, you know, we're sitting there, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm here with Richard Pryor, you know? And, and he goes, you want some fruit? I go, yes, yeah. so I ate an apple, and I think I, then I ate another apple. And he said, look, motherfucker, I said, I have some fruit. I didn't say, eat up all my motherfucking fruit. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. He goes, no, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> True story, you know what I mean? True story, but he was interested in the woman that was actually playing his wife in the film, this white girl named, who's a friend of mine to this day, Barbara Williams, dynamite actor. And yeah. she was the ex of uh, a friend of mine, Nick Mancuso, who had a series back in the day for Stephen J. Cannell called Stingray. And uh, anyway, he, he knew that me and Barbara were friends. He wanted to make because he had a crush on her, you know. And I go, oh! This is why you wanted me, Art, to bring me up the trail so you get the, the 411 on, a, on, on your co-star because, you know, she's a friend of mine. <laughs> you know, but, no, it was, I'm so, so blessed. Good good times, you know, just, you know, these guys. And, you know, it's like the, the guys that I, I watched as, as a kid yeah. that inspired me to want to do this. And I got to Hollywood. When I got to Hollywood, it was like a renaissance, you know, it was, it was like it from theater. I mean, there was theater everywhere and little theaters and all of the producers and casting directors, everybody. And that's how, that's how my career jumped off because Hollywood came out to see these little plays and, and what these theater actors were doing from New York and, and so forth. And a lot of the guys that, that took me under their wing, and to this day, I, I pinch myself. Uh, the late Ron O'Neill, Superfly, he was he took me on his wing. Now these guys gave me advice. Art Evans to this day, one of my best. Glenn Turman, the great Glenn Turman, yes. who by the way has a documentary coming out, premiering a screening this weekend called The Legend of Glenn, Tur Glenn Turman. Everybody's gonna be there. Um, uh, Art Evans, uh, you know Richard Roundtree, you know sure. the original staff. Yeah, you know. All these guys, I go out and I smoke cigars with, with them, and they want to know my opinion about their work. And I'm like, <laughs> to this day, I'm like, wow, they actually want to know what I think about what they're doing. These are the guys that inspired me. 
you know. So it's 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 been. If I drop dead, God forbid, you know. Today it's I you know it's it's been you know it's been very exciting, but very very hard too, you know, because a lot of these guys it's like rousing cash back in the day. Um, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Ossie Davis and them, you know, these people, they died broke. It's hard to keep this thing moving, you know? Rosalind Cash died on a friend's couch, broke, you know? And, and part of it, with, when that generation of actors of color were coming up, there was a big complaint from the black community about black exploitation. So that, that ended a lot of work for that generation of African American actors, because it was like Hollywood was like, well, we don't we don't want to piss off the black community. Let's stop doing these kinds of films. Well, those were the only films that you know where there was a lot of work for all those actors of color. You know, that's why I don't believe in the term black exploitation. Nobody's exploiting you. You're working and you're making money. <laughs> you know what I mean? But but uh, no, it's it's uh, it's it's it's, it's been, you know, I don't know. I know I'm just rambling. <laughs> no, and, and it's, this is a lot of information that people can take in. Another thing people don't know about you is you work with Chris Rock again on Everybody Who Chris. Yeah, um, yeah, Chris. It's funny Chris. because Sheena Arnold's on this show, and you work with Tommy, Payne, Tommy Ford Payne and Harlem Knights, and they both right. work together on Mike. So it's right. a crazy connection. How actors so yeah, far well, going well, Chris, um, I, I run into Chris and and uh, Chris said I, I want to bring you in to, to meet the team and I have an idea uh, recurring. Uh, it never recurred. It was just that one where I played played the the oldest, the a forty a forty something year old still in junior high school, <laughs> jacking up little kids. <laughs> It's, it's hilarious, you know what I mean? You know, taking their lunch money, you know? But uh, they never, I did one episode, which Chris directed that episode, you know, and uh, but they never brought me back, you know. It's, you know, promise this and promise that. Hollywood's full of false promises. You just don't know which way anything's going to go, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful. It was another opportunity years later after CB4 to just hang out with Chris on the set and, 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 and he's cool, you know, uh, you know, I would like my wife's a fan and he'd get on the phone and I call his, my wife, you know, you know, I, I love surprising my wife like that. You know, uh, I did that when I was recurring on ER. Yes. When I was re when I was recurring on ER and, and I called my, my wife and she answered the phone and I put the phone up there and that this was already planned and John Stamos goes, Hey Danny, how you doing? John Stamos. You can hear her going, Ah she screamed. <laughs> you know, one of her heart heart throbs, you know. <laughs> so From Full House. Absolutely. And speaking of, of Full House, we Connie, are we gonna go back? I'm gonna go back for a minute. Connie was released June 6, 1997. And this has become one of the number one hit films in box office. You might as well say 19, you might as well say 1947. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe how time how time is just just moving and moving, moving and moving and moving. Yeah. Now no. This film grossed over two hundred twenty-four million dollars. You've you've worked with the great Jerry Bruckheimer yeah. and Nicholas Cage. So, what was it like getting the call to work in this, this iconic? Oh, hold on, I want to make sure I'm not. I want to make sure I'm not getting a ticket. Oh. oh no 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 no! I think I'm okay. Oh you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. go ahead. Yes, I was saying that you've worked with the iconic Jerry Bruckheimer and Nicholas yeah. Cage in this project. Did yeah. you have any idea that Kanye would be as big as it is today? It's like, what, 25 years later? Uh, once again, like see before, no, we did not know that we were, I mean, I mean they just did the 25th anniversary of Con Air and, and they did a worldwide screening simultaneously. And 
they had here in LA, the those of us who were unemployed, <laughs> you know, Nick Nick couldn't come because he was working, and Malkovich is in Europe working. Um, but um, but some of us showed up and did a Q and A and 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 this stuff, and we we had you know we we talked about how we had no idea that uh that it was gonna be it's one of the top ten uh action films of the 90s you know in the hollywood chronicles you know what i mean and really the movie doesn't make sense if you go and look at it it's so discombobulated but still it, it works on some it, it wasn't what it was intended to be um or, originally it was supposed to be like that old classic film the dirty dozen with jim brown and oh, those yeah. guys yeah. This was supposed to be the convict version of the Dirty Dozen. But while we were in the middle of shooting it, four months, four months, uh, while we were in the middle, middle of shooting it, they brought in writers from Die Hard, the Die Hard, Die Hard team. And, oh, right. yeah. and, uh, and, and uh, uh, started rewriting. And, you know, when they, when they, when they rewrite, uh, uh, stuff while you're shooting is never a good sign uh and and a lot of there are about five guys who went on like emilio rivera from the uh mayans he's the star of the show the mayans there are about five guys that were in that in, in con air that you don't even see in the film because of the cut uh that went on to have really big careers um and um uh, and the, the thing about it when they were when they were shooting when they were uh, rewriting it, they were taking everybody's lines, and I remember I got so sad because it, I, you know, this was going to be a big opportunity for me in terms of showcasing uh, my craft in a hundred million dollar Hollywood action movie. This was a big opportunity for me, and uh, uh, and and and. Uh, and, uh, uh, and when uh, the guy going around giving out tickets, I'm not sure what's going on. But anyway, um, and uh, when they started chopping my lines, man, I was so depressed. I remember walking out into the desert where we did the big action sequence and sitting in a chair crying. And Earl Billings was another unsung, uh, well-known actor. came by and goes, why are you crying, man? You know? Uh, he, he, I said, they, they, they chopping all my lines. He said, well, you work, right? You're going to make about a quarter of a million dollars on this film, and you're making a lot of money, right? You're working, right? He said, what are, what are yeah. you doing? Yeah. And he got my hair right, you know? And another story is, what star does this? I remember we were in a scene, and Malkovich was aware that my lines were being chopped up and cut. And and uh, and he gave, gave me about three or four of his lines. You know, yeah. that's the kind of that says a lot about John Malkovich. You know, of course, those lines were cut too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but they were cut not before; they were cut in the cutting in the room, in, you know, in the editing room. But Malkovich gave me some of his lines because, uh, and that was just so generous of him. You know, I remember before I took the gig, I I figured I go hmm because it's always like you always think about it doesn't really matter because you get there and you're a pro and you do the work. The work is the work. The work. But sometimes you do have to contend with a lot of bullshit with these the, the big stars, you know what I mean? So in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, Cage and Malkovich, who's going to be the asshole here? You know, and I said, well, Malkovich is going to be the asshole. Cage is going to be one of the boys. It was, it was just the other way around. Malkovich was one of the boys, and Cage was sort of not the guy, you know, but... Yeah. uh and and then the 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 supporting cast cage at the time was getting pissed off because in his rider there was a gym a semi truck a gym 18 wheeler gym that had to show up at whatever location we would fly on jets and stuff you know and and but that the whole cast you know and and but that semi truck that gym had to be there for nick cage well, we took it over, <laughs> and Nick just did not like that, man. You know, but the energy 
that you see in the film is the energy behind the scenes. It was a bunch of a bunch of knuckleheads, hard asses, and many of us like I'm I'm an ex convict that turned my life around and went on to get my master's degree. I come from a good family. Uh so I don't have that. I came up in the hood as an excuse. It's a long story. But a lot of the guys that like Danny Trejo, Emilio Rivera, myself, a lot of the guys that were hired in those roles were those roles at one time in their lives. So it was a bunch of hard, hard asses play uh cast to play hard asses with a first time feature film director who was British, who had never directed a film, Simon West, who who came from commercials, which was Bruckheimer's thing, like Michael Beck came from commercials. Bruckheimer was very visual. You know, you know what I mean? Uh so uh so you got this first time feature film British director with these American hard asses. He Simon God bless him W he didn't know what to do with us. <laughs> we were playing pranks on each other and just you know, but so a lot of the energy you see in but the the thing is to this day, all of us are like a family still. You know, it, it, I mean, look, you spend four months together. I mean, it's not the only film you spend four and five, six months on. I mean, Hollywood does that a lot. But what they don't do is what they did on that film is they carry actors, supporting cast the whole way. Now it's a drop pickup to save money. In other words, we'll have Ty work three weeks. We know we're going to need him on week eight. So we're going to drop him for two weeks and then pick him back up three weeks from now. And that's three weeks that I don't get paid. Well, they carried they carried us the whole four months, even when we weren't working, you know. Uh, so we all did well financially, uh, and Bruckheimer was just Bruckheimer was just a class act. He yeah. treated everybody, everybody, uh, as if they were Malkovich or Cage, you know. Uh, uh, I remember when we came back in after a couple months into L.A. to do some interiors in the plane. Um, we were flying in on a private jet, uh, a Boeing uh, jet, one of the big jets, and from the back end of LAX, and we were looking, we were like, what's all those lights? And as we got closer, we saw that it was just a line of limos pull, pulling up to the tarmac, right to the plane, where every one of us had our own driver and limo there. That's who Jerry Bruckheimer is. You do you want to work for Jerry Bruckheimer. <laughs> you know, he took care of it. He would uh I remember we had a couple weeks down, man, and his private Lear jet, you know, it was like, hey Jerry, can we have your guy drop us off in Vegas for a couple of days? Or just for the day and but yeah, go ahead. He ran out a nightclub somewhere on location just so we can you know, class class guy, man. He takes care of everybody, not just the stars. You know, but um, but a really one of the greatest experiences, cinematic experiences of my career. You know, it's hard to get. Uh, I haven't had a film of that magnitude for that long with that kind of money um, since. You know, what I mean, so I'm grateful uh, for it. You know, four months and just rolling around and and just having fun. And that's what we are. We just, that's what acting is. And we forget because we get so serious about got to get that role and blah, blah. We just, you know, Lawrence Olivier once said, the great Lawrence Olivier once said, acting is a masochistic form of exhibitionism. It's not quite an occupation for an adult. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you got to, you got to, which, which kind of messes you up in life because you got to be, you got to, do the adulting thing in life, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but here we are caught up in these actor bodies and these actor things, you know, so, you know, but, but yeah, it was, Con Air was, was, yeah, it was, I'd love to have one of those, those today. <laughs> yeah. And it received multiple Oscar nominations. And another thing people don't oh, know about yeah, it yeah, is yeah. Music, the song, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. For this project. Like yeah. it's yeah. such a cult classic and everyone has watched Con Air 
if not Conair, then CB4, if not CB4, oh, yeah. then Harlem Knights. Now, yeah. you received an NAACP Image Award for Best Supporting Actor for Buffalo Soldier. And not too long ago, the NAACP right. right. Award right. just went on. So what was that experience like? Um, you know what? I'm, I'm going to have to drive and talk because I'm in a – I hope that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, turn that off. Because uh, evidently I'm in a – it's L.A., you know. Um, what was your question again? I was saying that you got nominated for an NAACP – you received an NAACP Image Award for Best Supporting Actor – for Buffalo Soldier, what was that experience like? I'm, hold on. Welcome, you're just coming in, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, we I are can, here. I can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, that's perfect. Cause it, what it did is it kicked into my car, my car phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. But You're uh, good. yeah, cause uh, my meeting here when I'm finished with you, this is a Roosevelt. Hole. We're in the center of Hollywood, folks, <laughs> and I'm taking you on a tour. <laughs> okay. But anyway, yeah. But anyway, um, what was your question? I'm sorry. I was saying that you received the award for best supporting actor. For Buffalo Soldier, which is an oh, amazing yeah. film and project, what was that experience I, like? I, I, actually, it was a stage play. Okay. You know, yeah. Actually, it was a stage play, and uh, and it was one of the hardest plays that I've ever done. And they they were trying to develop. There is there is a um, a film with Danny Glover called Buffalo Soldier. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and, uh, but this was a stage play even before those films. And it was one of the hardest plays that I've ever done. One of the hardest roles that I've ever done. Um, and, uh, it was a hit in Los Angeles. Um, I'm going to just pull over here until Mita May comes and tap on my door again. <laughs> you know. But, uh, yeah, we're in the center of Hollywood here. Uh, matter of fact, I'll show you guys. Yeah, we're on Hollywood Boulevard, and this is the man Chinese in the hard rock. Can you see? Yes. Yeah. You know? And uh, this is where we are. And, and anyway, um, but, um, but, no, it was, uh, it was a play. And it was one of the most uh, difficult pieces that I had ever done. Uh, very challenging because of the period piece and the costumes. Um, because they, we're wearing these, these wool uh, union military uh, yeah. uh, under the hot lights and all these heavy guns and so forth. And we did that play with um, a great director acted in that play with me by the name of John DeFusco. And, and he was one of the writers and directors of a, of, a, of a Vietnam play called Tracers, you know. Uh, and, uh, but that was, uh, yeah, that was just one of many plays that, I, that I've done here in Los Angeles. Um, pretty much Buffalo Soldier. You know, but of, of all the plays that I've done here in L.A., my most touted is um, and what I'm most proud of is working with the late August Wilson. Uh, we did the uh, the 20th anniversary of Joe Turner's Come and Gone. One of August Wilson. I'm assuming that your audience your audience knows who August Wilson is. Yeah, panelist. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I did the L.A., the Los Angeles premiere of Joe Turner's Come and Gone opposite the late, great Roscoe Lee Brown. Uh, 
And uh, if anybody knows anything about Roscoe Lee Brown, you know, in film, he goes all the way back to doing films with Alfred Hitchcock. You know, he was a groundbreaking African-American, African-American actor. He goes all the way back to doing uh, films um, like The Cowboys with John Wayne, you know. So here I am on stage with Roscoe Lee Brown opposite him, man, which was just, it was just, I learned so much, you know, and I was very nervous, too, because originally the director had offered me the role of Jeremy Furlow, and equity-wise, the producers wanted to give it to um, uh, one of the kids, you know, who was not equity, so they wouldn't have to pay as much money. Uh, and to a, well, an apprentice, okay? And uh, it didn't work out initially. And three days, three days before, three days before this, uh, the play opened, premiered, the director and Roscoe called me and said, we need you to come do this role. Now, if you know anything about an August Wilson play, uh, Oh my God! It's just tons and tons of dialogue, you know. So, but it was no way. So I got a call on Wednesday for opening night of Friday to learn these lines, come in and jump down with the blocking with these guys. And and I did it. I did it. <clears throat> but I remember in the middle of rehearsal, I was so nervous because August Wilson was sitting in rehearsals, and Jeremy Furlow <clears throat> is, is the guy that played him on Broadway. The character is a big buff, you know, dig, ditch digging. He wasn't a little Creole brother, light skin, <laughs> like me, get me, you know. So August had a problem with that initially, which made me very uncomfortable. But by closing night, man, he left me a note, job well done, you know. And also opening night after only like maybe two days of rehearsal, um, what what was nerve wracking was opening night, sitting on the front row with people like Sidney Poitier, <laughs> you know, and Mayor Tom, Bra you know, the the mayor and and and, and Sidney Poitier and Stevie Wonder and all of these, you know, opening night, and I had only had like two days to rehearse and really just remember your lines. Yeah, remember my lines and the blocking and to really just make this role mine. But I pulled it off. I pulled it off. And it was one of the greatest. I stretched, as we say, as an actor. Uh, and uh, it was it was a great experience, you know. So, you know, and it was a big equity show, you know, stage, you know, where, you know, it's a union show. You know, a lot of the other plays you end up doing around are called equity waiver plays, you know, which means they don't have to pay you as much because the houses are small. But the work is like, mm, you know, and it just, it can elevate careers like it did my generation. I mean, the guys above me, and, look, and at the time, it was me, Angie Bassett, Samuel L. Jackson. All of us had the same agent, you know. You know, I remember we, we all was starting out together, Angie and Sam and and, and so forth. You know, it's just it's so strange to see how careers, how careers, uh, you know, the the, tra the trajectory or not <laughs> right. of, of careers and stuff. And, you know, but I wouldn't change a thing. Uh you know, it's uh, what it, well, one of the things that I coach and I teach, and that's, you know, this has to be in your blood. If you think you're going to get rich and famous by doing this, you have another thing coming. So your focus yeah. should be on being the best actor that you can be. And then you might have a chance to get rich and famous because then you're going to have the craft to pull that off, you know? Absolutely. So, and and yeah. speaking of the craft, um, you taught – Master Acting for Film Classes in Beijing, China, for Studio yeah. Institute Global. And yeah. what is that experience like for you? So many people out here that want to become actors, directors, producers. 
but right. they're just like, what direction do I go in? Well, it was, well, the whole China thing was because I don't speak Mandarin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. So I was uh, what I, I got. I, I got that gig because remember I was telling you about Luther James, who was one of my my teachers. Um, yeah. When I was getting my master's degree, who coached Diana Ross? Well, when Whitney Houston was doing the bodyguard, they called him to coach him, and he was too old, and they recommended me. And one of one of I was one of two or three because I think the girl I can't remember her name that play, played uh, Whitney's. Uh, uh, sister in the bodyguard, uh, Michelle, I think. Anyway, she is a big coach, too. I think she was also one of the coaches with Whitney, you know, but it was just for minimal time, only just a couple of days on some tech, technique things that I with Whitney you know, for the bodyguard. And that's how I got into the coach because Luther had recommended me. And that led me to coaching uh, the late uh, Tupac Shakur. Yes. You know, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, for a couple of things that films and, and and so forth. At the time, I was unable to really tout that I was doing this because you had to sign waivers and and keep this on the thing that they who you were coaching them. But that was fine with me because at the time, it's not like now. You can say, "Hey, I'm Ty Granderson Jones. I'm an acting coach and teacher." and still be a, a star of a sort and still be working in film. Back then, it was like, oh, well, he's only teaching and coaching. He's given up the game. Now it's, it's more prestigious that you're doing it all like that. So it's okay to talk about it now. You know what I mean? Uh, but the and, – and so my name, Underground, got around in terms of uh, – you know, coaching and teaching, and that's how I ended up getting the the gig to go to China for three months. I think everybody should see China once, but not for three months. <laughs> Please, not for three months, you know. Um, but I learned so much because I remember, see, what the studio was doing in, in China, what China wants to do is they, they want to elevate their their actors to Hollywood standards, you know, Chinese, Chinese, they're very stiff because it's a communist country, so that stiffness is in there, is in their culture, you know what I mean? And, and, and therefore it translates into their work as actors, you can't be, you know, like robots and, you know, communists, so they wanted someone to come over and uh, loosen them up by Hollywood Film standards, and they're on the old, they're in they're 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 into the old, old Hollywood contract from you know back in the day we heard, not that I'm that old but I've heard about you know back we heard back in the fifties and the forties and fifties you know they had contract players each studio yeah had contracts yeah. you know Marilyn Monroe was owned by a studio they had contract players you know uh, Sidney Poitier had contract players. Uh, so that's what China is today. They their studios they have contract players. So I was hired to come in this particular studio with about fifteen of their contract players to create uh, a film uh, program and teach them technically how to be better film actors. You know, and I remember the head of the studio once we got to China, they had this big. Uh, dinner and celebration, you know, and he sat down with me and go, so you, you, uh, you good actor, I know your work, uh, but what makes you think you come and you speak Mandarin? No. I go, no. Go, well, how you think you make my actors better? I said, well, it's a little too late for you to be concerned with that right now. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm halfway around the world sitting in your, you know, in the studio. Um, and uh, but what I told him, I said, acting is human emotion. Yeah. Period. And 
I don't have to know Mandarin to know emotion. I can look at you right now, I told him. I said, I can look at you right now, and I know that you have something uh, something bothering you that's personal in your mind. I can read you and go, how you know? Yeah, I go, yeah, I said, because that's what we're trained to do, to know. We pick up. We watch people. We we translate that into our own. We we, we put that into our bag. Yes. <laughs> as actors, you know what I mean? So what I would do, I would get material, and I had to prepare them for three films. And and I acted in one of the films with you. And what I would do is I would have to, I would get the material that, and have it translated into Mandarin or vice versa. But I had a, uh, what do you call it, uh, a translator, translator. with me. A little translator girl with me everywhere. So, but after a while, I didn't need her anymore. Once we know what the scene is about, and once we know what the characters are about, I don't need to be uh, ultra sensitive to what's the language and what's coming out of your mouth because it's about the emo- it's about what's happening in the scene. So I didn't need to to know that anymore because once we understood and found a way of working. It was all about emotion, you know? And me coming from uh, having, you know, I'm a sort of a method actor, you know what I mean? So so it was about emotional memory, sense memory. And, and you know, acting is more than just words because the great actors... When you're watching the great actors and the ones that's really on their game, it's not really what they're saying. It's what we're seeing and watching in between what they're saying. Yes. That's where yes. those characters live. You know, it's, it's you know, it's like what what is that actor thinking when he's saying what is this? What's driven? You know, th- those kinds of things. But I just expanded once again by that experience of three months in China of working with actors who didn't speak English and and directing them and coaching them in films and in and, and classes and technically to make them better act and I tell you there wasn't a dry eye the day I left. You know? And I mean it it, it wasn't a dry eye. It was a great experience for me, uh, as an actor. Um uh, because one of the things I do, I don't like to use the word teach. It feels arrogant to me. I don't think anybody's really capable of teaching anybody anything. But I think, but I think we are capable of sharing what our knowledge is. So I'm not going to teach you anything, but I'm going to share with you what I've learned. And what if what I've learned is not going to elevate your game, um, then I got to roll up the sleeves and we got to find some new shit. And then I'm going to learn. Boom. And then guess what? I'm growing. I'm, I'm, I'm growing again. I'm a better actor now than I was yesterday, let alone, you know, and I'm always open to learn, you know, you got to get your ego out of where you got. You got ego, you got actors, in, especially in Hollywood, that they can only do the work because I'm Ty Granderson Jones and i got to like, take myself serious. And that's the only way they can exist. It's in a false way, from my, in my humble opinion, of working. I've never taken myself serious, ever. But I take my work serious. You, you understand the difference? You and know. you have fun with it. You make your characters come alive. You have fun yeah. with it, where some actors in this business, I've heard stories where it's just like they take it above and beyond and it's just like loosen up, have fun in what you do, and understand right. and realize your craft. Right, right. You know, and, and, and get out of this, you know, the successful thing. You know, we got a lot of things, not just in Hollywood as actors, but on this planet, we got a lot of upside-down ways of thinking. It's like uh, mm-hmm. two things. Uh it's who you know. No, it's not who you know. It's who knows you, okay? You know, <laughs> it's not who you know. If they don't know you, 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 
you can know them, but if they don't know you, you know. And the other thing, well, you know, oh, well, his success and money changed him. No, it only gave him, in a, it put him in what he felt is a, or she in a comfort zone where they can reveal who they always were. <laughs> money doesn't change you. Success doesn't change you. It only reveals who you always were. And if you were faking to be that good guy, and now you feel like, I ain't got to be that good guy no more. I got all the money in the world. Not understanding that that pole is very greasy that you climb. <laughs> you know. And especially for people of color in this game. You know, this is a industry industry that's about the money. You know, you know what I mean? And it's one thing if they they like you and want to work with you, but even if they don't like you and you're making money, you're good. But once you cross them and they don't like you anymore and you're not making them any money anymore, you're done. So it can't always be about the money and stuff. you, you got to be – you, you got a lot of mediocre – Actors that work in this town, and they do well, and they're good people, but they're not really great actors. You know why they work all the time? They're easy to work with. They don't cause problems, you know? You know, even if you're not making them any money, people go, you know what? He's not going to put any any, any butts in the seat. He's not going to put any butts in the seat, but we know one thing. He's going to bring it, and he's going to be fun to work with. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's so. the type of threat that people want. And speaking right. of that, you've released a project as well, um, a political action thriller, Diamond, which is now streaming on Amazon. And yeah. you co-starred, produced, and directed this project. So tell us a little yeah. bit about Diamond. Well, well, it's only a short, you know, but it's a very expensive short <laughs> uh, because we. We were using it originally as a uh, a what, what 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 Hollywood is doing now. See, the short film game has changed. It's not like it used to be back in the day. You have a lot of big stars who are writing and directing their short films because it's a way to walk it into the studio as, as a sizzle reel and to prove to the studio that, like Charlize Theron, you know, she's done a show, you know, direct, you know, like she want to walk in and go, look, I've directed this. And look at this film, and I want to develop this. They use it as a sizzle reel to develop into a full-length feature. And that's what Diamond was intended to be. Um, you know, I, I could say this now, and you know, over here, turning over in this grave, but one of my pals that really contributed to the budget of this, that believed in this little project, uh, that didn't want his name, because he's, and when I say who it is, you're going to get it, and you're going to know it, because... He did the same thing with the group, the Bengals, and wrote most of their songs. Prince. Oh. Prince, Prince gave me a, 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 a big part of the budget on this film because he believed in it. Mm -hmm. See, I had already, I went off and did a film, a little urban film, which is really, it's not a great film, but it's a fun film, but the music, is, or the soundtrack is off the chain. It's called uh, Tapped Out. Remember Giorgio, R&B artist from... Back in the 80s? Yes. Giorgio, Giorgio wrote and directed this and starred in it, and I was in it. And Madonna. Maverick uh, Entertainment. That's Maverick, what Maverick, Madonna. Yeah. Ma Ma Madonna distributed it, and Prince was a silent producer on it as well. And that's why when I had the diamond idea, I got it. So, yo, Prince, look, man, I need some help to put this little idea. He read it. He looked at it, you know, blah blah blah, and and uh, and we were in the middle of when he had still on the back burner to try and do something with it. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, yeah, man, that that diamond. But it's it's a fun little film. You know, I love uh, uplifting you guys. I love uplifting women. You know, I love I love. Uh, in a lot of my writing, it's about putting you, you know, your your rights across the board. You know, women, the LGBTQ community, I'm that guy. You know, uh, 
and that's what Diamond is. Diamond, Diamond was ahead of the, the game, you know, because it was, it, you know, I don't want to tell anybody, but it was about lifting women up and going after the conservatives that want to take women's rights from them. But how do you do that? I'm finding ways to, to preach but entertain because it's tricky. You don't want to get all preachy. You want, to, you want people to pull the popcorn out and go, man, that was fun yeah. to watch. But by the same token, Take you, want, you want to... Lesson away from it also. Right, 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 right. And that's my game. And that's why I'm so excited about this Western that I wrote called Chance. You know, it's 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 a, it's about a it's 1884, and it's about a a successful uh, uh, slave who ran away during the Civil War. Fought the Civil War. In 20 years after the Civil War, he has a, a very successful horse ranch, married to a white woman who was the daughter of the slave owner that ran away with them together. And 20 years later, their past catches up with them. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Chance. You know? And the villain in it, the big villain in it is, is, a, is a mulatto brother, brother, who thought he was always better because he was in the house. You yeah. know? <laughs> you know, I don't want to say too much about it, but but... Once again, my message into this is if you can make Clarence Thomas a villain <laughs> in a Western, <laughs> you follow me? You know, that's what that's I do. Me. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a line, he says, you know, the, the, the lead says, you know, it's Negro, it's Negroes like you. It's more evil than some of these white folks. And you know your project has a has a message. So where yeah. can we expect chance? Because just the description of it and everything, where can we expect this? Well, I know right now, right, right now we anything. just right right now we just starting to get it. Me and Stony Jackson, because um, Stony uh, co-wrote the story with me, and then I wrote the script. And there's a co-starring roles in it for both me and Stony. Great roles, of course. Um, and right now we're just trying to package it. We're trying to find the money and the director, you know. So the audience out there, we're looking for investors. We can't do this film for less than $7 million if we're going to be done right. And what really inspired me to write this Western was my distaste for, and when I say this a lot, some of the black community and Hollywood community, black, and, you know, they 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 not feeling me. First of all, well, westerns are have to be authentic. You know, you're going back to Sergio Leone, Woody Stroll, Clint Eastwood. Look at Unforgotten with Morgan Freeman and Clint Eastwood. Westerns have to be gritty and authentic. Yes. You know, they can't be so pretty hip-hop music video. You know, and so when me and Stoney watched uh, The Heart of They Fall, on Netflix, wherefore you have five actual black cowboys, which is a, it, it, that's a, what do you call it? I don't know what do you call it? Black cowboy. You can't say black cowboy, but cowboys were black. See, a lot of folks don't understand that the name cowboy was a derogatory. Uh oh. It, no, we're good. That was a. Uh, Emergency, uh, you know the emergency thing they do. Got yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just clicked it off. You know, evidently there's some flood. Uh, we're having a storm out. It snowed in Hollywood yesterday. Yes, the weather is shifty. I'm in South Carolina, yeah, yeah. so I think we're about to get some yeah, rain off. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. But uh, but anyway, the term cowboy was a derogatory term. That slave on that a white folk threw on a cowboy, and of course, like everything else, the brothers made it look good, and then they wanted to call themselves cowboys. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but in the heart of they fall, you have five black characters, cowboys, who were real 
They actually exist, but they didn't exist at the same time. Each one of those guys uh, deserve a narrative, a film of each of their own. That's just to begin with. But you got these five black guys who actually existed, cowboys, in a movie at the same time in the same period, which is not true, killing each other. Now, during a period of reconstruction during the Old West, black folk killing each other was the last thing on black folks' mind. Okay? <laughs> you know, they was trying to pull together and find a way. Yeah. Doing reconstruction. Doing reconstruction. So you got this Western with this hip-hop Jamaican soundtrack. The town is all pretty and lit up like Las Vegas. Guys wearing earrings and the language like we talk today. With five characters, it was like Colors. Remember Colors? The gang? It was the Crips and the Bloods in the Wild Wild West. We've had enough of that, you know? And so you have a black community upcoming that don't know Western genre or don't know the history of cowboys watching that, and they go, oh, yeah, that's how it is, because folk are, the, the movie going pu public can be very gullible that way, especially in our black community, you know? So I was like, me and Stoney decided to say, you know what? Let's write a Western that's going to say something that is authentic, you know, and true to the genre. And that's going to really say something to the, uh, to the African-American community and others yes. with, with, with the, 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 the right Afrocentricity that it needs. And that's what we did. And we're very proud of it. And uh, it is, it's just great. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're going to be folks that say, well, why did the brother have to marry a white woman? Well, you know, some feel like that. You know, it's like one of the characters, the, the villain goes, he goes, the Negroes like you, there's even more evil, evil than some of these white folks. Says the Negro that risks his life for a white woman. And you know what his response was? It's a love and divinity that you ain't got an inkling about. How? You know, and we, we, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. If you fall in love, my great grandfather's white. He's from Paris. You know, why am I going to deny that part of me? I, I embrace that part of my heritage just as much as I embrace the African part of my heritage and the Latino part of my heritage. I'm part Cuban and all of that. It's like people you say, Ask me, well, what are you? I'm America. That's what I am. <laughs> I'm everything that America is. That's what I am. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so it's, it's you know, we just have to get around all of that. So, you know, but I, I don't mind being controversial in the right way. <laughs> you know, so, but, but yeah, um, we're looking to attach... Uh, a bankable director that can attract a big B list talent and attract the money. You know, uh, we can't do this. Uh, you know, uh, for less than uh, seven million. You know, uh, right now Glenn Turman has the script. We'd love for him to direct. You know, Glenn Turman's a real cowboy. So am I. Not on Glenn's level, but I've been riding. I cowboy with Glenn and Reginald T. Dorsey. Yeah, I've ridden in the Bill Pickett rodeo. You know, uh, so the cowboy thing is uh, very dear to me. You know, so when you, so when you, when you kind of jerking it off, like the Netflix thing, I'm like, oh no, no, no. Now, all the actors were great. Come on, who's not gonna fall in love with Idris Elba? <laughs> Come on, and Regina King. I've known Regina. I've done episodes of. 227 back in the day. I knew Regina came when she was a little girl, you know. Yeah, I did a lot of comedy back in the day, you know, and I got out of that because I could have been uh, Kevin Hart long before Kevin Hart. I could have, but I back, I was Webster's teacher, you know, and my thing is, is I didn't want to have a career that's just going to 
make fun of my, my stature. I'm a small guy. Yeah, I'm ripped. And built. I used to fight Muay Thai, all of that. But still, in Hollywood Spanish, I'm not six four. You know, I'm a small guy. I'm like me and Prince, the same size. You know what I mean? You know, and uh, but I didn't want to make a career making fun of the, the short guy. Right. I didn't want to have that career. So I went in an entirely different direction and really um, started really marketing me because I'm about underbelly. I'm about exploring the underbelly. The, 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 see, I came from, I was a little gangster for real. You know, and I know what that life and the underbelly, and that's where the real interesting stuff is to me, the underbelly of society. Let's explore that. I wanted to do it all. I wanted to have a career like Joe Pesci. I wanted to have a t career like Tim Roth, which you don't see actors of color having. Where Joe Pesci can go off and do some comedy, should be funny as hell, and turn around and go do Goodfellas. Yeah. In Hollywood, they didn't... Give us that latitude, longitude to have that kind of career. You could just be one thing, the little funny guy. So I decided I'm gonna be. I'm not gonna be the little funny guy. I'm gonna be the little bad guy. And that's where it was more interesting for me, you know. Um, so I don't know how I got under that. <laughs> no, Rap. no. And and people are learning. It's Black History Month. So you guys are going to get a Black History fact at the end of the show and the final thought of the day. And I hope a lot of people ta are taking all of this knowledge in if they want to get yeah. to the record. And because uh, because the thing about yeah. it, the, the thing of, the thing about it now is my generation of actors, the Reginald T. Dorsey's, myself, um, and, and look them up. You know, you know, we in the '80s and '90s, it, we paved the way for what is happening now. Just like yeah. Glenn Turman, just like Glenn Turman and Richard Roundtree, and those guys paved the way for my generation of African American actors, and and Latino and brown, the brown and black actors. Uh, uh, you know, you know, they they we my generation because we were all there weren't a lot of roles like now, like the Michael B. Jordan. There could be no Michael B. Jordan if it wasn't for. Reginald T. Dorsey, and I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to sound like an Eagle Man, Ty Grant, the things that we were doing paving the way, because there were no, there wasn't, now there's just, in their 20s and 30s, uh, kind of like age brackets, all of these roles for Latinos and blacks, and it wasn't like that in the 80s and 90s. We was all scrambling. We walk in the room, and all our boys are there to read for the same role. Yeah. You know? So, but we kept busting it out and trailblazing and trailblazing, and here we are. Now you got Michael B. Jordan. Breaking barriers for actors you know? of color. And when I right. look at people like, she's one of my favorite actresses, Cheryl Lee Ralph and Ruby D and so many others, they paved the way. Her brother, her brother Michael Ralph is a good pal of mine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So many other and Shirley Ralph. Shirley Ralph wasn't. She wasn't an overnight sensation. People forget she was on Broadway as one of the original Dream Girls. Yes. You know, this is not a. This is not a sprint. And, and I always tell you, I said, look, it's getting too hot. Get out the kitchen. Or I tell the guy, hey, you might want to consider packing your bags. <laughs> You know, because you, you, you're either a warrior and you're getting down with this. Because we have so many, just as an actor alone, it's like, it's like it's not about why you didn't get that. You didn't, I, I, I gave a great audition. It's not even always about the work. Here's an example. Last year, whatever, I'm watching Netflix, and there's this movie with The Rock, and Gail got a uh, Wonder Woman, and stuff and I'm like, why does this movie sound familiar to me? Why does this dialogue? So I went back to I went to my office, got in the computer and I keep my sides and that's what you call pages of that they give you to audition for a film or a TV show. They call sides. So I went back, I keep my sides. I went back into my files and I went, Oh no wonder I read for this project and I'm looking looking at the guy that got the role and I killed it. I killed it when I auditioned for it. And I mean, and, and it reminded me, when I look at the guy 
got it, got the role. I go, okay. Now I'm I'm being reminded. It's not about how good you are. There's so many other uh, components that go to why they go with the other guy. And at the time, they didn't put it out there that this is a movie. Uh, hold on. They didn't put it. They at the time they didn't put it that this was a movie uh, with the Rock and Gil Gotta. You just you know they don't say that you know blah blah blah. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But this wasn't the case. So when I'm watching this, I'm saying, okay, now that I see it's the Rock. I wouldn't have cast me in that role playing the little villain. They wanted a short guy who's really ripped and buff to play the lead villain. But standing next to the rock, I'd look like a midget. I know that's not proper to say a little person. You know, I would look like a little person right next to the rock because he's so big. So the guy that they cast is about five seven, five eight, standing next to the rock and Gilga. He's still short. You follow me? You know, right. and 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 the other thing too is, here I am. I look like the rocks mini me. <laughs> you know, you know, I can look, I'm the rocks mini me. So that wouldn't have worked, you know. And I'm gonna go. That's why I didn't get the role, you know. And and maybe I wouldn't have even gone out to read for it if we would have known known that the lead you can play opposite the rock. We both light scan, we both got bald heads, we're both yoked. I'm his mini me. <laughs> so that, you know, that wouldn't that work. Why sometimes people don't get the role. There's other things. Like good be not what they're looking for. I mean it's so many it's a number of components that go into it for why some How you match is, up. How yeah. you matching up with the stars. It's like I tell my wife sometime, I said See this movie here? I never had a chance in the movie to see that Kevin Costner movie, see that Bruce Willis movie, see that Sidney Poitier movie, those roles, those characters opposite. I never get those roles unless the director is thinking out of, and I'll give you an example where, where a director with me thought out of the box. Why I would never get those roles, people don't understand. Those men are huge. Kevin Costner is like 6'3". Bruce Willis is 6'3", 6'4". But you don't know that on film because they're casting everybody around about the same right. height. So everybody looks average. So they're not going to cast me in that role unless you got somebody who's really into, like when I did, I did a film. My first film was a film called Salvador. It was a, Oliver Stone's first film, technically. Not technically, but sort of. And Oliver Stone wrote and directed Salvador. It was nominated for Best Picture, Oscar. And it was nominated, and James Woods, the lead, was nominated for Best Actor. If you've never seen Salvador, it's a great film, and it's based on a true story. Anyway, the breakdown for that role was authentically African-American, huge, intimidating. Now, at the time I had hair, and my hair is curly and stuff, and I'm looking more Latin than anything. So I go in and read for the role, and Oliver Stone walks in, and he goes, what are you doing here? You're not black. And I stood up, and I go, what the hell you mean I'm black? What you know about being black? I said, you know what? The hell with this. I'm out of here. I'm like, whoa, wait, 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 whoa, 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 okay. Come in my office. I'm going to read you anyway. Now, there were about four four or five well-known black guys sitting out to read for the same role, sitting in the hallway with me. Cracking up at me, making poking, making jokes in front of me, like, hey, what am I, you know, because they're, they're really right for the role, you know, and what, what am I doing? And so anyway, I go in, and he asked me to do this improvisation with James Woods, and I do it, and I nailed it. And he said, whoa, sit down, right there on the spot. He says, you got the role. I go, really? He said, yeah, you got the role. cast and director standing in the corner. I said, you got the role. It was a big black, you know, supposed to be big. He says, but do me a favor. When you leave, don't say anything to those guys because I still have to audition them. I still have to read them. Now, these are the very guys that were picking at me, right? As soon as I walk out of the office, I looked over, headed to the elevator, I looked over to them, I go, I says, you motherfuckers can go home. 
<laughs> True story. Those words. You can go home now, because I was, you know. But the way uh, the way Oliver shot it, because James was about six feet, then he never put us in the same frame. He had me standing up, Jimmy sitting down, or me sitting down, or him standing up. And you can never tell that I was so much smaller than him because Oliver wanted me to. He liked my craft and my energy. So you have certain directions and certain people, they, they'll look past the size and height thing. It really just depends, you know. But a lot of it, like I said, it is matching matching up. Your energy. Your energy. Right. Yeah. D.W. Moffitt is here, ladies and gentlemen, says, going to reach out to you when I'm back in L.A. That is for you, Ty. Oh, you know who D.W. Moffitt is? They came Dude, in, they're my, following you. They're saying, tell what you, up, I, big guy? I tell you, I tell you, it, what, did he chime in? Yes, he's here. He said, speak oh, the truth. That's, that's, one of my, that's one of my dearest friends. He's one of the most phenomenal stars and actors uh, in the game. Look him up, D.W. Moffitt. He's worked with uh, some of the greatest directors in the world. Matter of fact, I got a Moffitt story uh, that's relative to Con Air. Okay. Like I told you, when I showed up, when I showed up on Con Air, I didn't know who was going to be that. Nick Cage was going to be, you know, an asshole, and or Malcolm was going to be an asshole. Who's going to be one of the boys? And so the first day I'm shooting well on location, and and uh, I'm in makeup, and Malkovich walks in. And he goes, "Are you Ty?" You know, and I goes, "Yeah." He says, "Moffat says hello." <laughs> He's one of one of one of Malkovich's very good friends. They work together on a uh, I forget this is one of those big time directors, uh, friend, uh, Italian directors, well known film back in uh, with uh, Leif, uh Tyler uh, back in the day. But that's my dear friend of many, many years, director, actor, you know, big, big, big time. That's big time Willie there, okay? <laughs> yes, yeah. and he said he's going to reach back out to you when he's in L.A. Okay. Okay. Awesome. I don't he says you're making me laugh. Talk soon. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, that. ladies yeah, and love you, So yeah. much knowledge and so much gems has been spit throughout this entire interview, and I hope you guys are enjoying it and taking this all in. My last question for you before I wrap up with my history and thoughts for the day, and this because this was such an honor to be able to sit with you and just go back in time throughout your prolific acting and the writing and directing career. You've done so much, and I know you just like. She's calling me a legend. She got, I, I call you that because you are. You you truly are. Right. You are okay. the inspiration of the next generation I, I, of actors that are coming out of color. I I, uh, I appreciate that. I'm humbled by that. But I ain't done now. <laughs> by far, I'm just getting started. All right. So you know, don't <laughs> you know? But uh, no, I, I I appreciate that. I'm humble. I'm humble when anyone wants to know anything or if I've touched anybody in terms of the work that I've done in my journey, in my career, you know, it's, uh, you know, being humble is, is a huge part of uh, the craft. You know, it goes all the way back to one of the greatest uh, directors, teachers, who was Russian, uh, Stanislavski. Yeah. He said, love not thyself in the art, but the art in thyself. And that's how I, I roll, you know. And that's why I keep people like D.W. Moffat in my life. We see things the same way, you know. You know, Moffat is a big time, big time actor. Never takes himself that seriously. Done a lot of big stuff. He's a human being, man. You know, it's like when I run into a fan base of guys, they go, "Can I take a photo with you, man? You from blah, blah, blah. I can't believe you're so cool." Well, you know what? I can't believe you're so cool because you guys got it the other way around. Actors should be genuflecting to their fan base and not the other way around. We should be humble constantly if anybody appreciates anything that we've done. Well, of course, you got those going around. Don't tell you know I'm, I'm you know get out of here with that. Right. You know, yeah. So 
So my last question for you before we wrap up is what piece of advice would you give to the next generation of actors out here? Because as you mentioned, Michael B. Jordan, there's so many new yeah. fresh faces, Damson, Andrus, um, yeah. from the show Snowfall, the new generation of actors that are coming out yeah. in this generation, right. in this era. What piece of well, advice that, and knowledge would you give to that? That's easy and it's simple. There are two, this is a two-part answer to that. Don't be afraid to fail. Mm. Uh, uh, Samuel Beckett had a quote. He goes, have you ever failed? Fail again. Next time, fail better. Okay, that's number one. Number two, get out of the, get out of the actor box. It's okay to be a hired gun, but write. Learn how to write. Learn how to make films yourself while you are marketing yourself as a hired gun. Get out of the actor box and understand part B to that is know that it's called show business. You have to do both. I wish I would have known this 30 some years ago, I've known it for the last 15, 20 years, but you have to be able to put your show hat on, take it off, and put your business hat on, take it off. It's no fun for artists because artists are right, we're right brain people. You know, people like the financiers and shit, they left brain, you know, they, they right. love that stuff, you know. So in order to handle business and marketing and all of that, you got to tap into your left brain. It's no fun for artists. You know what I mean? The right brain is fun all day. That's what we you got to, you know, you know, take that right brain hat off and put that left brain hat on. And there you have it. And not only that, but it makes your vision even clearer and, and, and then more de in depth, or I would say looking through the glass, insight right. on life and so much things you want to do with your career. So I'm going to start it right. off with the final thought of the day, ladies and gentlemen, since it's Black History Month, um, the quote ties into what Ty just said, and it goes like this. This is from Booker T. Washington. Success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life, but as the obstacles which he has overcome while trying to succeed. And that comes from Booker T. Washington. So it ties into never giving up and keep going forth with what you decide to do with your career and your passions and desires. So that's our final thought of the day, ladies and gentlemen. And today's historical Black history figure that we are going to honor is Rachel Robinson. Now, she is the other half of the team that gave us the first Black player in the Major League Baseball in modern times. And she keeps the dream alive as she's the head of the Jackie Robinson Foundation. So today, we honor Rachel Robinson for Black History Month, ladies and gentlemen. So today's show was a legendary show. We sat down with the one and only Mr. Ty Grandison Jones. And I know he hates people calling him a legend, but through my eyes, through my lens, you've done the work. You've mentioned so many people who've helped along the way. So Thank that you. qualifies legendary Appreciate stuff. you. 100. Appreciate you, Miss Stevie. Appreciate you, okay? All right. You're so welcome. All right. Don't start making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Try, try, trying, to be cool, trying to be cool and hard and stable here. <laughs> I want to get emotional. You're not paying me for that. <laughs> All right. Oh, my God. This Thank was you. such an amazing conversation, and I would love to chat with you again in the future. Definitely. Anytime. Anytime. Personally, you know where to find me. Get at me. Okay? Definitely. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. Ty Grandison Jones. And joining me Thank Monday, you. we have Nathaniel Anderson. So make sure you guys tune in Monday. This has been Style by Stevie. Make sure you guys have a safe and fabulous weekend. I love you all and take care. And this interview will be up in case you missed it. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.